at the outside i'm extremely grateful to dr ajay dr sp singh and the team insl for giving me this opportunity the topic which has been allotted to me is treat all versus targeted strategies when you encounter a patient with hepatitis b whenever you want to treat a patient of hepatitis b the main aim is to suppress the hbb dna make an attempt to lose e antigen try to normalize the alt and optimally if you are able to achieve you should be getting rid of hbsag but problem is as of today in 2024 standing on this podium we have a very limited plethora of medicines which are available for treatment and these will include anticovid tenofovir taf and the pegylated interferon and uh, uh, all of us know that over the last almost decade none of us is using interferon as a part of therapy for hepatitis b what i'm going to discuss is that why not treat all the reason is we have guidelines which say there are different phases of hepatitis b and hence not everybody requires hepatitis b treatment guidelines do not re recommend treatment across the board there are indication that patient with low dna and low alt or a normal alt do not have an advanced disease there may be a sub group of the patient who are having immuno tolerant disease and are not likely to respond to antiviral therapies then there is a suggestion that nucleoside analogs may not be useful in patient with uh, immune tolerant phase and then you are concerned about the longevity of the therapy infinity of the therapy as well as the safety of the therapy let's start discussing these issues one by one coming first to the guidelines across the board if you look at different guidelines including our own guideline it basically hangs on to three parameters you are looking at alt you are looking at the raised dna and evidence of inflammation or else there is another way of looking at it if you are a youngster if you don't want to spend time on this busy slide just pick up a zooming glass and look at the elevated alt so those with elevated alt require treatment those with normal alt do not require treatment as simple as that so a combination of the raised dna coupled with elevated alt is what is important when treatment but problem is have let's analyze what does what have we achieved with these guidelines over the last almost 10 years since we have been repeatedly publishing these guidelines overall if we go by these guidelines alone and the implementation of the policies only 20% of the patients which have it burden of the disease in the world have been diagnosed and only 2% of the patients who are eligible for treatment have been treated till date this is the study from africa as well as the western pacific region the region which has which has the highest incidence and prevalence of hepatitis b also data from the us clearly shows that there is a when you are trying to treat and diagnose hepatitis b there is a bias towards ethnicity and the sex and overall about 20% of the patient even in the western world are diagnosed and 20% are aware that they have a disease and of that only minuscule component is available for treatment so if you look at the overall world scenario 20% of the times we diagnose the disease 10% of the patients are eligible for treatment and of those who are eligible for treatment 60% are compliant and of those who are compliant 60% will benefit and of those with 60% benefit if you see overall only 2% at the end of the day get having uh, get start having the treatment at the end of the day and what are we achieving with the currently available antiviral therapy you have different goals you are normalizing elt you are converting hbe antigen positivity into negativity you are definitely able to suppress dna but so far as patient uh, patient has come to you with hbsag presentation that loss occurs in not more than 2% of the patients problem with poor utility of these guidelines is they do not look at other factors of hepatitis b which are relevant guidelines do not worry about the psychological well being of the patient patient is worried about the fear of development of hcc a lot of anxiety and depression he has concerns about the transmission to the family member including the spice in countries like india it is a stigma to have hepatitis b and every time patient has any other symptom in presence of hepatitis b he tends to attribute that these symptoms are occurring because of hepatitis b not only that if you go by guidelines alone we should we should realize that 30% of the patient will not fit in with these compartmentalized guidelines we should understand that the virus is a dynamic disease 
it keeps on shuffling between the different categories. You cannot try to fit it into a particular category. Virus is a moving, it is a dynamic etiological problem. Third, 70 percent of the time you can fit into the guideline, but every third patient will not fit into the guideline. So these are the classical, this is the classical teaching. You are supposed to have four phases, immune tolerance, immune clearance, low replicative phase and reactivation phase. But what happens in these patients who have normal ALT but raised DNA, we do not know. In fact, 30 percent of the patients will tend to fall into the so-called gray zone. And whenever we try to give the therapy in patients who have HBV DNA, we never talk of HBS AG antigen positivity, which Dr. Joe's talked about, because this is an important component in occurrence of HCC in addition to HBV DNA alone. There is also a uh, there is also a proposition that if you have a low replicative virus, possibly you are not going to have a disease. But look at what what happens in this patient. Thirteen percent of the individuals with low viremia at presentation over a period of one year will develop disease, which is active disease. That means every seventh patient who is at the moment having low viral replication is likely to come up with an active disease. Moreover, when you are treating hepatitis B, do the guidelines look at any of these? Do they look at age? Do they look at ethnicity? Do they look at exhaustion of the T cells, genotype and the co-infection? These are all determinants which will decide what, what is going to be the impact of presence of hepatitis B. Also, there is a good analysis of 3,624 patients who have been denied hepatitis B therapy because of the strict guidelines given by the international guidelines. Look at what happened. Of these 161 patients who developed hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, 45 to 60 percent of the patient of these patients who developed HCC, they did go to the hepatologist but because of the one reason or another, they were denied antiviral therapy. We do not know, had they been given therapy, some of them may not have developed hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, it has been shown that in patients who are treated versus those who are not treated, in even in immune tolerant group, there is a higher incidence of HCC and liver related death in patients who have not been given treatment. And even in patients who have chronic hepatitis B, this is the retrospective analysis of 855 patients in the so-called gray zone in which guidelines will say, oh wait, do not give anti th antiviral therapy. The chance of development of hepatocellular carcinoma is 30 percent. That means in gray zone, if you were to treat all, there is a 70 percent reduction in hepatocellular carcinoma. So this is a good data to remember. So what about uh, long-term antiviral therapy and immunotolerant patient? What is an immunotolerant patient? Ideally, anybody who is less than 30 years has high DNA, there is no inflammation. This is a classical example of immunotolerant patient. In fact, a lot of patients who are diagnosed to be having immunotolerant phase may not be actually having immunotolerant phase. And in fact, EASL even it recommends that we should get rid of this term called immunotolerant phase and we should call it as a chronic HBV infection. Even there is a difference in ASLD and EASL in trying to define what is the immune tolerant phase? ASLD looks at chronic hepatitis B as an inflammatory state. ESA looks at chronic and hepatitis B as a viral state. So anybody in ESA uh, guideline with the age of more than 30 years, irrespective of the degree of liver damage, needs antiviral treatment. Whereas ASLD thinks that you need to have a minimum inflammation to cause to have antiviral therapy. So overall, we are still not sure whether we treat immune tolerant patients or not. Let's see what happens. In immune tolerant patients, immune tolerant phase patients are always not benign. In fact, 15 percent of these patients will develop elevated ELT over the next few years. Five percent of the patient will develop uh, cirrhosis of the liver over the next 10 years. Even in a patient with, uh, if you go by LSM, three percent of the patient will develop significant fibrosis. In fact, even in patients who have normal ELT beyond the age of 35 years, 60 percent of these patients have an advanced underlying liver disease. And if you go by the age, anybody more than 30 years, even if you are immune tolerant, you are likely to have a substantial disease. There is more data to show that 3 percent of the patient in immune tolerant disease phase, they develop HCC during a follow-up period of 5.2 years and 10-year incidence of HCC in the so-called immuno tolerant phase varies depending upon the genotype and ethnicity 
between 2 to uh, 20 percent. HCC related mortality is certainly going to increase with the age. The higher the age, the more the chance of HCC, even if you are in the immune tolerant phase. In fact, there has been a Korean study which has given a good justification of treating even immune tolerant phase. There is a difference between immune active and immune tolerant phases that if you are not treating immune tolerant phase, you have higher incidence of HCC as well as the liver related death. Another study from again the uh, again uh, published in 2016 have shown that whether you are immune tolerant or immune active or immune active disease with E antigen positivity or negativity in all these subgroup there is a high integration of the HBV DNA into the host genome and most of these patients already have clonal expansion of the hepatocytes. So they questioned the very scientific basis of withholding antiviral therapy in subgroup of the patients depending upon whether you are immune active or immune tolerant. I'm, I'm sure this slide has been must have been quoted billions of the times. There is a direct correlation between the degree of the viremia as well as the occurrence of HCC. Not only that, HBV infection does not cause cirrhosis and HCC. There are other attributes to development of HCC. HBV leads to accumulation of the DNA mutation. It leads to incorporation of the virus into the host genome. It leads to the epigenetic changes. It leads to DNA modification, basal core, uh, uh, basal core promote, uh, pre core mutation. It changes the micro environment, leading to clonal expansion of the hepatocytes. So it's not that hepatitis B is causing cirrhosis and HCC. You have something occurring at the back, back end. And then we keep on waiting for hepatitis B to come to a stage of 30 years when you develop hep hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, that has been shown that. 20% of the HCCs tend to occur even at an age younger than 30 years. Why this controversy? Why should we not treat all? Because we know that in immunotolerant phase, there is a high DNA and we know there is a direct relationship between the level of DNA and uh, level of uh, development of HCC. We tend to forget that HB, HCC in HBV is also related not to the level of HBV DNA alone, but also to the age gender, family history of HCC, the HBSAG quantitative as well as the genotype. This is something which is never considered by the guidelines. Studies of the immuno, the, the reason why there is a controversy is because there have been 17 studies, but unfortunately because of the poor designs of the studies, they have never shown in randomized trials that immunotolerant therapies will be helpful in subgroup of the patient. And finally coming on to the safety, we have a 10 year safety data on TANIFO, which is absolutely safe. There is hardly any resistance. Even in patients who are immunotolerant, you have a persistent suppression of the HBV DNA. 5% of the patient in the immunotolerant phase may lose HBV, HBSE antigen over a period of follow-up. Long-term therapy has been shown to suppress HCC. In South Korean cohort, they have shown that treating even immunotolerant patients rather than monitoring them may be more cost-effective. And in future, we have Dr. Lee Abhidas on the uh, podium. They are going to come up with newer therapies, which will be of finite duration. Another worry was, can we stop this antiviral therapy? In hepatitis B viral therapy, uh, we have a good uh, suggestion that if you, are if, you, if you have lost HBE antigen, give consolidation phase, then stop the therapy. In E antigen negative therapy, you may give uh, consolidation for a period of about three years, then stop the therapy. In both the cases, once you are able to stop the therapy, the chance of relapse is very low. We are going to come up with newer therapies and uh, as presented by Dr. Lee yesterday, with these newer therapies, which will be coming in the market, possibly in the near future, you may have better cure of uh, hepatitis B. Currently, th currently available antiviral therapies also cause suppression of the HBV DNA and also they decrease the hepatocyte colonic size which is important for uh, separation of virus-induced hepatocellular carcinoma. And hence, based on all the arguments which I have given, a proposed algorithm for hepatitis B by uh, Jacobson's group, if you look at all parameters, once you are HBSAG positive, all say treat all, except in one given situation when you don't need to treat. So ASLD says you treat because it is an inflammatory reaction. Easel says you treat because it is a viral infection. 
So why don't we club it and come on to the WHO which, which says, oh, treat all. Once you have hepatitis B, why not treat all? So this is the current hepatitis B virus guidelines from WHO, which clearly states that depending upon the degree of the fibrosis, rise in a DNA and abnormal ELT, all these patients should be given. And in fact, they have liberalized the guideline more frequently. And there is a data to support from Egypt that this is a 20 years retrospective data published uh, only about two months back. This was shared by Professor Robert Gish yesterday. That in it has been shown over the 20 years that it is cost effective to treat this patient even in the absence of uh, the indication by the international guidelines. And it has been shown clearly that those with low DNA and low ALT are also likely to have a substantial disease. Moreover, whenever we try to treat these patients, which do not take into consideration the patient community in general, we do not integrate the values give, imposed by the patient, we do not look at the holistic aspect of hepatitis B, we only look at in, within narrow prismatic vision at DNA, ALT and inflammation because our uh, treatment goals will also depend upon patient reported characteristics. So unless we simplify the guidelines, it will be very difficult to get rid of hepatitis B. The only reason for conceding not to give antiviral therapies, if somebody can ensure me that you have a normal ALT with very high DNA, with normal ASM, no family history of HCC, no comorbidity, regular follow-up and patient has been explained in detail that you have an integrated virus which can cause malignancy. Even in that condition, I will give, I will tell him not to give antiviral therapy to hold on till Dr. Lee tells us with better therapies till tomorrow. So sum up ladies and gentlemen, 80% of the patient with hepatitis B as of today do not know that they have suffering, they are suffering from hepatitis B. 10% of the patients ultimately get treated. Of those who get treated, 60% are compliant. And of those who are compliant, 60% will respond. And those will respond overall, 2% of the patients are treated. So patients who are untreated and left alone because of the stringent guidelines, are likely to develop hepatocellular carcinoma because of the integration of hepatitis B into the host genome. So we need to have different approaches for hepatitis B. We need to liberalize the guidelines and we need to take the patient's characteristics which have not been taken into consideration. So at the moment, I think it is important to stick on to the WHO guidelines for eradication by liberalizing the guidelines. Thank you.